One, two. Good morning. The next talk will be about unlocking FileFault, the uh, encrypted file system in Mac OS X computers. All of you Mac users probably know this. Um, besides the fact that they claim to use AES with 128-bit, it was so far not really sure what was behind it, how it worked. Now Jacob Applebaum and Ralph Philipp Weinmann had a look into that and they will present their findings and what they found out, how it works and what is really done there. Please welcome them and have fun with that talk. Thank you. So uh, just to start off, we have uh, a wonderful guest performer here who's going to perform a song for us. This is Johannes from Monochrome. It's so embarrassing, I tell you. He's wearing an Amish hat that's made in China, but he actually bought it in the Amish village in America. Yeah. So he's going, so to, he's going to play us a song just to sort of set the mood for our talk. Okay. Uh, yeah, the problem was I was really drunk yesterday at 2 o'clock in the morning and Jake Applebaum came and said, come on, I have a talk at 11.30 tomorrow in the morning and all the people, they have to, like, we have to wake them up. We have to do a little performance for them that you really can like, dig into cryptography you know, and stuff like that. So uh, he said, okay, uh, uh, we need a song about Apple. And I said, okay, I drank seven Club Mate, so I can't, drink any, uh, I can't sleep anyway, so I can, th I can think about uh, doing a, a song, and I'm really proud it's a copyright infringement. Um, and actually, I don't, I don't even uh, use an Apple, but I thought maybe trying to write a love song for Apple. So that's what came out, and I hope you somehow can enjoy it. But anyways, it will be... It, it will, be on the internet soon, whatever. Okay, um, so I think I have to switch to my media player. Thank you very much. <laughs> Something only monochrome could come up with. <laughs> Thank you. So today we're going to talk about FileVault. And I think that the results should be 
interesting for everyone here. I, I'm interested to know, though, uh, everyone in the audience, if you use FileVault or if you have a Mac or something along those lines, maybe a different descriptive program, could you raise your hand? <laughs> so we're going to talk about um, what FileVault is, and we're going to talk about problems that other people have found and that we found with FileVault. Uh, we're going to talk about reverse engineering on OS X. Uh, we're going to talk about um, like the non-free uh, disk image framework. We're going to talk about a uh, free implementation that we're going to release. Um, we're also going to talk about some of the other uh, oddities of Mac OS X. And uh, we have a, a special uh, guest uh, hacker here. Um, this is Hikari. He's a very amazing guy. He's uh, one of the founders of Torcon, and we we're fortunate to have him here. And uh, he put together his contribution in about, uh, what did you say, about 45 minutes or an hour or something to get it working? And then <laughs> not including up until five minutes ago. All right. <laughs> so, um, my motivation and Ralph's motivation for this was that we were pretty much interested in disk crypto. Uh, personally, if you saw my talk last year, you know that I have a sort of like passion for data being secure. Um, we also wanted to protect against theft, so we're really interested in the native disk encryption that comes with OS X. And everybody uses laptops. I mean, most of the people here using FileVault, I assume you have laptops. Um, but it's undocumented, and we wanted to know if it was secure and how it works. And Apple claims, you know, unbreakable trillions of years and all that stuff. So um, on the marketing side, they say, FileVault secures your home directory by encrypting its entire contents using the advanced encryption standard with 128-bit keys. This high-performance algorithm automatically encrypts and decrypts in real time, so you don't even know it's happening. <laughs> yes. File Vault, increase security for your computer. But we actually do want to know what's happening inside. <laughs> that seems like a good thing. Um, so the internals are not well documented. Um, you can look at the man page for HDI util. Um, the disk image framework is private. You have no source, no headers. It needs to be reversed. And uh, the kernel module stuff is not open sourced. So, so what we looked at first was. Um, there's, the only documentation around is for the HDI util. This is very good because HDI util has a command that allows you to list all the plugins. Um, disk images is like a very modular framework, so it consists of different plugins. And um, so far, the only third party um, plugin known that was developed outside of Apple's is a um, plugin for virtual PC images. Now, there's um, a front end and a back end. The front end is the HDI util program. The back end is, consists of basically a kernel module that's handling the attacher of disk images and a couple of helper programs such as disk, image helper, disk images helper and HDI eject D. Now, um, when you, oh, you have to go to the next slide. Um, this um, disk image framework um, has, um, several backing stores. Backing stores are basically the uh, containers that hold your data. And there's like a CBSD backing store, which is just for normal files that hold data. Then there's um, like a CRAM backing store for, for RAM disks and different other things like a CURL, vector, a CURL backing store so we can have like the, um, the image on like an HTTP server or HTTPS server. And another thing is you have encodings. and what we will look at mostly in this talk is the uh, C encrypted encoding. That's um, basically the encoding that does the AES-128 and the other cryptographic stuff. And um, this C encrypted encoding is um, the heart of FileVault, basically. Um, the other thing is that FileVault um, does not allocate like um, a static amount of space on your hard drive, but it has a sparse disk image that grows. Now, there's different types of um, disk images that are supported by the disk images framework. There are like shadowed disk images where you only write back the changes to one image and you have a mass image in another um, container. Then there are compressed images and, well, sorry, and then there are sparse images. Now, um, to get to the crypto details, um, when, you, when you have like um, the C encrypted encoding, which is basically the outer layer of um, a file vault image, like you have 
an inner layer, which is the sparse image, and you have the outer layer that's produced by the C encrypted encoding, then all of the blocks get encrypted in four kilobyte chunks um, using AES-128. And that is in CBC mode. Now, the IV for each of these chunks is generated using um, HMAC SHA-1. And the, um, the key for, um, th sorry, the, um, the, there's a key that's used for generating these IVs. And that's um, the HMAC key. I, I'll go into where these keys come from in a second. But for now, it's just an HMAC key. And um, basically, what you do is you have this HMAC key, and you prepend the chunk number to the HMAC key, and then apply the HMAC. And that truncated to the one, first 128 bits gives you the IV for this, um, for this chunk. Now, the keys are um, randomly generated when you, um, when you create your file vault, and then they are wrapped in the header of an image. Now, this header is, um, well, it's kind of a misnomer because in some, sometimes it's a header that's in the old versions, like there's version one and version two of the metadata format. And in, in, um, in version one, um, it was actually at the beginning of the disk image, and in version two, it's at, sorry, the other way around. In, in version um, one of the, um, of, the, uh, of, the, of the format, it was at the end of the disk image, and in version two, it's at the beginning of the disk image. Now, what's interesting is that um, the wrapping of these AES keys is done using triple dash for some reason. So, in fact, I mean, it's kind of cheating because now the security doesn't only depend on AES, but it, if either AES or triple dash folds, you're screwed, right? Okay, and um, what they did when they um, went to version two of the metadata format, which was, I think, in, um, in Panther, is they in introduced um, an option for having an additional asymmetrically encoded header. And what this is good for is um, for a recovery feature. I'll go into that a little later. Um, first, let's um, look at the... Um, the normal way you unlock your, your file image again. So the, the, um, the passphrase for your file image is your normal login password. So if your login password is wrong, uh, so is, is, is weak, your, your, um, your file wall is used as well. Um, what they use for deriving the key for unwrapping the other keys is something called PB, PBKDF2. That's a um, very standard algorithm. It's in the um, RSA PK CS, CS5 um, series of algorithms. And um, they use this algorithm, which is parameterized with 1,000 iterations, which is, well, it's kind of low. But um, you don't want to wait forever for your disk image to attach, so that's probably why they choose a low number of iterations. And um, what's interesting as well is that most of the crypto parts are actually implemented um, in um, um, something called CDSA, that's the, the com, um, the, that's the com, um, sorry, it's an architecture for cryptography that is, was developed by, by Intel. And um, this architecture actually is open source. And it's modular as well, so it's like bloat. I mean, there's this huge meta framework, and then you have providers sitting in this meta framework, and there's one Apple CSP provider. And this is also what makes like um, porting um, like the reverse engineered implementation kind of hard, because then you have to port all of the other crap as well. I mean, CDSA uh, exists on, on Linux as well, but you'd have to port the Apple CDSA provider. So what we decided to do for the uh, free implementation was we did away with all of the CDSA stuff, and we use um, OpenSSL instead, because that's much leaner. For performance reasons, um, this image just has its own AES implementation. However, it pulls in the um, SHA-1 from an OpenSSL lib. So this is kind of inconsequential as well, because, I mean, they have CDSA, but um, some stuff comes from other parts. And um, the... The wrapping that they've introduced um, in, in, in version one of their header format 
which they've discarded again in version 2, is loosely based around um, a standard that is commonly referred to as PKCS7, which is uh, RFC 2630. And what is kind of funny about this is <clears throat> they wanted to implement it with a, with a random IV that they store on the drive, and they actually do store this IV on the drive, but they don't actually use it. So um, it looks like somebody you know, started an implementation and you know, got held up and didn't quite finish, and then they ditched it and went to another header format. But all that stuff is open source. Um, the, re re the reverse engineering was just the disk images framework. OK, now to the recovery mechanism. When you enable File Vault, you can or basically you have to set a master password. This master password, in turn, protects um, a keychain that is um, in your library keychains directory. And this um, recovery keychain, it's called, contains um, one certificate and one private key. And this private key is a 1024-bit RSA key. By having this key, you can decrypt another struct in the metadata, in the metadata that um, also contains um, the blob where the um, encryption password and the HMAC password for um, decrypting the real data that's in your file world images is contained. Now, the problem is um, there's something called the Lenstra Vahoyle um, heuristic. And what this does is basically it establishes a mapping between the parameter sizes of um, symmetric and asymmetric key cryptography. And, well, Apple claims they have 128-bit security, but this, if you have set a master password, is not quite true. Because by having set a master password, you have this 1024-bit key on your drive, which is, this key is not encrypted, right? I mean, it's sitting out in the plain text. I should add, like, FileVault is only protecting your home folder. It's not protecting all of the other folders on your file system. Now, 1,024 bits asymmetrically, according to Lenstor for whole um, heuristic, means 72 bits symmetrically. That's not a lot. Usually, these days, you should have at least 80. Okay, so the, that we went into already, the, um, the headers um, of version 1 live at the beginning of the file, and the version 2 headers live at the end. And in... <laughs> In uh, 10.4.7, they actually um, made the, um, the version 2 headers um, mandatory for sparse encrypted disk images. That's probably because when you log out, the disk images get compacted. Now, if you think about what happens if you compact a disk image, it, it shrinks, right? And you have the metadata at the end, and you have a power failure, for instance. Where's your metadata after that? Well, whoops, gone. So that's um, why you should have it like in the new format. Now, um, let's look at the gory details. Um, the, the password header, in principle, is very, very um, generic. I mean, they could swap out, they could easily swap out um, the key derivation algorithm, they could swap out the, um, uh, the PRNG algorithm that they use for um, generating temporal keys when you re-encrypt, for instance. They um, could have different algorithms for the symmetric encryption of the blocks. They could have different modes. They could have different paddings. Um, but they don't actually use that. They just have one C encrypted encoding. And that is, I mean, that statically is AES-128. Um, that's kind of interesting, I think. Um, I'm not sure what future versions of, of OSX have planned, um, but what I'd really like to see is um, Apple opening up the Disk Images framework and allowing other people to write plugins for it, because then you could theoretically also mount um, Disk Images, or rather um, loopback devices um, in the form of disk images from other operating systems, so you could have actual interoperability, something that's kind of missing in the market of um, 
disk encryption these days. I mean, there's TrueCrypt, which is pl cross-platform, but it doesn't run on OS X. And then there's um, PGP, PGP disk, which um, runs on basically everything, including OS X, but it's not, not open source, really. So um, go to the next slide, please. Um, reversing um, the disk images framework was actually kind of quite easy, because um, disk images is C++ code. And when you look at um, the, uh, the binaries, you can extract like the full signatures of every method of a class if it's not obfuscated, and Apple has not obfuscated disk images. So all of the analysis basically was, was done using like O-Tool, GDB, and um, the debug and, um, output of HDIUtil. HDIUtil, I should add, has um, a little debug switch, which is great because when you turn it on, it gives you all of the internal, um, like it, it gives you all of the internal steps it has done. It outputs you the um, HMAC SHA-1 key. It outputs you the encryption key. So you can verify that you've actually, actually done the right thing when you've reverse engineered and have written your own implementation. Um, initially, I thought it might have been easier to um, reverse engineer um, disk image framework using um, something called Boomerang, which is a great um, reverse compiler. But unfortunately, um, Although it supports um, macho, um, the macho binary format, which is the default on, on OS X, um, it doesn't really work so well with PowerPC code. And after I patched it to work with, um, with um, Intel code, it worked better. But um, it like bombed out on me in like three quarters of the cases. So it wasn't really useful for generating more than like uh, one or two functions from, from the binary. So, um, but actually, if you look at um, the disassembly, if, if you look at the PowerPC disassembly, it's not that hard to see what's going on because um, the, 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 uh, the calls that they make to the, um, to the CDSA framework um, are very similar in structure. So once you've figured out one of the calls, you get the hang for the rest of them. You just have to be careful when you, because it, it's, a, you have to follow a lot of pointers to the structures. And on OS X right now, there are, as I'm aware of, no good, um, no good reverse engineering tools. Um, there's Ida Pro for, for Windows, but um, you can't really use something. There's no no similar thing such as Ida Pro on on the on the OSX platform. Now um, the results that we have is um, we have something called vile fault decrypt. Actually, that's a spelling mistake on the slide. It should be a V and an F instead of an F and a V. What it does, it you feed it an encrypted um, D image either like a sparse image or um, a non-sparse, like UDIF image, and it, out, it outputs you the decrypted image if you have the correct passphrase. This tool works with both version one and version two encrypted disk images, so even if you have like an old installation and um, you wanna like transfer your data off that, but uh, you don't have the install media, but another box which runs an open system, can still get the data off it if you have the passphrase or if you can guess it. <laughs> um, what it doesn't do is it doesn't um, expand the sparse images to a, a real disk image. This is kind of a problem still because um, what that means is um, if you have a sparse disk image, you can't mount that, say, on the Linux because although Linux has support for HFS and HFS Plus, um, well, it doesn't know how to, to, to use sparse images. So what's needed here uh, is like another converter that um, con converts these sparse images to full-blown um, images that can be mounted. But that is uh, fairly trivial from what I've see seen. The code is very rough at the moment. Um, for instance, it doesn't do the uh, recovery thing yet, but um, we're working on that still. The code works, and it will only get better. 
What we also showed is that the cryptography of uh, file vault does not only depend on AS128, I'll reiterate that again to make the point, but it also depends on um, triple DES, which effectively has only a bit, uh, an effective key length of 112 bits, or, and on the secure, security of RSA124. So if either of these three folds, you're screwed. The other thing um, that's bugging us about Firewall is that we'd actually like to have full disk encryption, not just you know, the home directory, because there are a lot of applications that spit all over your file system, like into temp most often. But also, have a look around what you leave um, behind in var log or in system logs, and then think about well, what, I mean, if, if you do something compromising, I'm not sure how many people are in the audience that are, um, you know, um, extra-legally active. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, basically, you, you might put information into areas of your disks um, where the police or other agencies can find them if they seize your laptop, and that's not such a good thing for you. So we'd like to have um, the full disk encrypted. This actually is possible using the Disk Images Framework because it has um, the um, CDF backing store, which allows you not to have um, a file as um, the container, but a whole device. Unfortunately, it looks like it's not possible using just um, the HDI util. So you have to hack something up that, um, that uh, makes use of um, the framework by generating headers for yourself, or you have to wait for Apple to do that for you. So maybe the next version has support for full disk images. I've heard that uh, it has recently become a requirement in I mean, maybe Jacobs can say something about that. So uh, I guess recently there's been a presidential mandate this summer uh, from our, our glorious leader um, about uh, full disk encryption for all federal government computers. Um, so this could be something that uh, uh, potentially would be a big market for Apple if they were to fix this and open it up. Uh, maybe it's possible. OK. Another thing that you have to look at when you look at um, any kind of cryptography, obviously, is you have to look where your randomness comes from. Now, with OSX, it's kind of funny, because OSX uses um, a very well-known and very reputed random number generator called Yarrow, but they heavily modified it. What this means is, Usually, in other operating systems, you have um, the kernel collecting entropy throughout um, the course of the day from various sources, like um, from interrupt activity, from like the number of pages you swap in and swap out. Oftentimes, you actually have a hardware number generator. I mean, newer, um, newer Intel Macs have, or all of the Intel Macs, have um, hardware number generators um, in the CPU. But um, from what it looks like, um, the implementation um, that they've chosen doesn't utilize any of that. It just um, gets the entropy from the system time. And how they do this is kind of backwards, because they have a, a security server, that's what it's called, running in the user space which feeds entropy to the kernel by writing to def random. Now, this security server, in turn, gets this entropy from where? Oh, the kernel. <laughs> and they do that through a debug interface, which is, I think, kind of funny. <laughs> they do that every 15 seconds. So. Um, I'm not saying that, the, um, that this design can be broken easily. I actually think it's quite hard to come up with a practical attack against it. But I still think it's not very beautiful. And um, you'd have to think hard about it to justify it, actually. I'd, I'd actually like a reason why they did that. And um, the other thing is that um, reseeds are, are done periodically. 
And these um, receipts are um, shorter than it looks because um, in, when you look at the, uh, when you first look at the, um, at the source code, it says 50 ticks. Now, you'd expect that 50 ticks are something like 50 um, times a hundredth of a second, but it's not. It's actually 50 musac. And um, initially, when your system boots up, before it's getting fed entropy from security D, the initial entropy comes from the system time, and it does just one reseed. So until security D comes up, your random number generator is not strong. Um, I'll leave it as an exercise to the listener to find um, things that get executed before security D comes up and feeds entropy to the kernel. Okay, let's go to the next slide. When looking through the kernel, uh, which you can um, easily get uh, from Apple, you get some really great quotes. And uh, these, um, these three uh, are excellent. They're really strange quotes. Um, I like how they um, explain what an IV is. And then they go on to talk about how um, they didn't want crackers to find their encryption patterns too easily which I think is kind of funny. Uh, in addition, they also talk about how they don't lock memory pages in certain circumstances. But what's interesting is that we know that Apple actually doesn't lock memory pages in almost all circumstances. But here, they just give an example of that. And curiously, they uh, also have some uh, problems where 192 and 256 magically just don't work. <laughs> and they don't really say why that is. But that's interesting. Um, so uh, Maximilian Dornziff, who I don't think is here, but it would be great if he was, um, he did some really excellent research on um, DMA attacks using FireWire. Um, so pretty much anything that uh, has a FireWire device is vulnerable to this unless you um, either patch the kernel or on PowerPC you can enable open firmware. Um, uh, at the Meta Lab in Vienna, Austria, there is a, there's a hacker by the name of Angelo Laub who gave a talk about uh, how to secure against the FireWire DMA attacks. It turns out that uh, on the Intel chipsets, you actually need to patch the kernel in order to fix this problem. Uh, he did that and provided the source code for doing that, along with a compiled kernel module, though I would probably compile it myself if I were you. Um, <laughs> and I linked that in the slides as well. Uh, but you should obviously be aware of this attack, and it is real, and it is probably possible that if someone's charging their iPod, they might also be dumping your memory if you have FireWire on your box. Um, uh, again, I, I talked about this last year, which is the swap files and memory issues, which is that basically um, you need encrypted swap to do disk crypto correctly. And Intel, um, uh, essentially 10.4, you didn't really have the option of encrypted swap, which basically meant that your passwords would get swapped out to the disk. Um, unhashed passwords would get swapped out to the disk. So basically no work whatsoever to recover the passwords. Um, and so if, say, there was any type of exploit on your box, uh, or if you have an airport card um, maybe in your box, I hear there might be some problems with the airport firmware and the drivers you could possibly go ahead and look for keys that way, too. So um, it's definitely something to keep in mind. And uh, I don't know how the internal is actually, uh, like the internals of this is actually implemented. But in loop AES, you have um, keys uh, with uh, the bits being shifted around so that you don't leave um, basically uh, a trail in your memory. Peter Goodman wrote a paper about this where if you have your key in memory for a long period of time, it oxidizes inside the memory cells. And um, I don't know if they do that or not, but it would be interesting if they opened this up so we could find out if they do. Because it seems like there are a number of things that if they've done that wrong, that could be another vector. Though that's probably not a vector anyone here really cares about. But if you do, you probably aren't using this. <laughs> As an example about how, uh, I mean, everyone knows we need to encrypt our swap, right? But if you were to go to apple.com right now and go to slash Mac OS X features file vault, they have a nice image on their page titled security. And you'll note the use secure virtual memory is unchecked, <laughs> which is excellent. So um, apparently Apple, even when talking about security, neglects to mention that little problem. 
something that uh, I haven't heard anyone else talk about. Um, Ralph and I were talking about this. And essentially, um, if, you, if your laptop runs extremely low on power, um, you're going to have your memory contents written out to var vm sleep image. And it's careful. However, it's not quite careful enough. So if you have encrypted swap on, the um, contents of the sleep image will be encrypted. But you're not actually asked for something like a passphrase when you boot up again. So what happens with the key? Well, guess what? <laughs> they write it to the disk. So um, this is not really useful. I mean, if you wanted to attack one of these laptops, uh, not one of these, please, um, but if you wanted to attack one of these laptops, it would be possible to simply unplug and just wait. <laughs> so uh, obviously another vector here is weak passwords. So um, brute forcing is nothing special, though I, uh, until a couple of days ago, um, Neither of us had seen any brute forcing uh, programs out there other than I'd seen a bash script that someone used. Uh, they just wrapped it around HDI util, which is not particularly interesting. Uh, then, um, was it like four days ago? Yeah. Um, we found, Ralph found actually, uh, brute dmg.c. Yeah, that it's um, known, it's, it's written by an as of yet unknown person. Well, we have. Um, we have like a hint of who it might be, but um, so far he hasn't answered. And this um, is um, a program that allows you to brute force um, version one D images. So um, it will not work on the uh, the current file vault images, but it will work on older versions. Like if you would be running 10.2 or something like that and had file vault enabled, or actually. Yeah, if you had encrypted disk images there, it would work on them, but not on the, uh, the ones on Panther and App. So, um, yeah, so um, uh, we mentioned previously that we had uh, David up here. And um, he was able to implement about 200 keys a second running on his uh, Sempron uh, 3300. Um, and that's kind of nice. Uh, I think previously we were getting about uh, less than half of that. Yeah. It was like 50 or 60 with uh, the brute DMG. Right. Can you speak into the mic? Uh, according to the brute DMG program, uh, they were saying they were getting about 50 to 60 per second on their, I'm guessing their PowerBook or something, or MacBook Pro, yeah. or something yeah. like that. So, so David here is going to demo a program that he wrote in an amazingly short amount of time, and it's a uh, uh, vile fault crack. So if you want to. Give it a shot. We switch to his laptop, please. It works. Okay. So yeah, the whole story behind this was that I met up with these guys uh, a couple days ago when I just got into town, and they were explaining how all the stuff worked. And they mentioned that it uses PBKDF2, and the WPA cracking stuff that I have uses w uh, PBKDF2 as well. And so. Um, it just uses a, a higher amount of iterations. WPA uses 4096 and this uses 1000. So um, I was like, oh, I could just modify my FPGA stuff and get it to work really quickly. So I, I modified my FPGA stuff and um, implemented a cracker using their source code. And so I'm, I'm going to demo that right now. So right now you can just run VF crack on your normal PC. And I just have this dictionary file which just consists of a bunch of different passphrases that you want to try. And, um, and so all you do is give it the dictionary file and then whatever uh, disk image that you have. And so this one's using the version one. And it's going through at about 200 per second. And it should find it in a little bit. But all, all this is doing is just running the PBKDF2 and then checking the header to see if everything works properly. And so there, if it just found the passphrase, which is one, two, three, four, five, six. And, um, and so I was like, wow, this is kind of cool. Uh, let's see how fast it runs on the FPGA. So I have this, this shell script that swaps over the FPGA to um, the special image that I made. So this is reconfiguring uh, the FPGA on my laptop, which is actually a compact flash card in my PCMCA slot. 
And uh, now it's running this code that is basically uh, the chip is accelerating uh, PBF KD or PBKDF2 cracking. So now all I have to do is basically feed it over the same arguments and specify which FPGA I want to use, which is the only one that I have in my system. If I had multiple ones, I could use different dictionary files on the same DMG file on different FPGAs and split it up that way if I wanted to. But this one will just run on uh, the one on my laptop. So right now it's going through at about 2,000 per second and it just found it. <laughs> so this uh, running on this little compact flash card uh, cracks this stuff about 10 times faster than a laptop. So if I had 10 laptops here it would be about the same speed. Um, and uh, this also works with the version 2 format, which I just got working about five minutes before this talk started. So uh, you can, here's a second image with the version 2. This has a different passphrase. Just running on my PC right now. And there, the passphrase is file fault. And then I can also run that on the FPGA and it does everything properly. So uh, that's my portion, I guess. Yeah. Thanks a lot. We can switch back to the other. Great. And, and of course, he did forget to mention that he has a cluster of what, 15, 16 of these sitting on your desk or something? Yeah, 15. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of the FPGAs, right? So um, that's a pretty excellent uh, improvement over about 70 keys a second. Um, <laughs> So, got some other references in here. Um, if you happen to be the author of uh, DMG Brew, uh, be nice to meet you, talk to you. Um, and it's all going to go up on crypto.nsa.org slash vile fault shortly. Um, actually, probably during questions, I'll copy it over. Um, we'd like to thank uh, these people for their help and for their input. So thank you all, especially to my lawyer, Jennifer Granick. <laughs> Our lawyer, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and every person at the EFF, thank you in advance. And everyone at the CCC. And also Club Mate. <laughs> So uh, now I guess is the time when we can take some questions, if anyone has any questions. Okay, I I'm sorry by advance because I'm, I'm going to try to talk cryptography early in the morning. So uh, it's just, you didn't mention about the security of Firewall. You talked about, uh, you, I think you know about it, but you forgot got to talk about the eventual weaknesses of the chaining mode, which is CBC, and I think there is some uh, kinds of attacks on CBC. Uh, it was talked about a lot uh, um, in loop OS or NDM crypt uh, some times ago. So uh, yeah, you, you've, you forgot about it, and I've, maybe there is a reason, or I don't know, but I think there is some weaknesses on CBC which could lead as well to Actually, um, in actually, using CBC is fine as long as you have a large enough block size. So, the attacks that you usually have um, on CBC mode is that you have um, collisions, basically, that happen when you have small block size. Say you have um, deaths and you have a 64 bit block size, then it wouldn't be a good idea to use um, CBC mode because you'd have a collision with a probability of 1 to the minus 32. However, for 128-bit uh, um, block sizes, the, uh, the probability of that happening is rather negligible. Um, you could, of course, use other modes as well. I mean, one of, the, one of the modes that you could use would be counter mode, but then you'd be kind of screwed because people could flip arbitrarily, could arbitrarily flip bits in your, in your blocks, and you wouldn't know, so that's kind of a bad idea. The only thing that would like really improve the security over um, CVC would be to switch to something 
um, like um, the, the, the disk encryption modes that have recently been discussed and proposed in the um, IEEE working groups, but those are not standardized yet as I understand it. So, well, um, what this comes down to is that actually um, Apple doesn't have much to be ashamed of cryptographically. I mean, they've, they've have a couple of slip-ups, um, but none of them turned out to be like devastating. The uh, like, I mean, the the iteration count could be higher. For instance, I've mentioned that already. Um, parts of the source code read like they couldn't really keep the um, different PKCS standards apart, like in some. In some sections of the CDSA or the CSSM source code, there's like a comment about a PK, PKCS1 padding, where it's actually, uh, well, PKCS1 is asymmetric, and they're talking about symmetric stuff, and it should be PKCS7 in that case. But uh, in principle, they've stuck with, um, with, uh, with well known standards, and they have avoided. Um, some attacks as well. I mean, um, it's good that they use IVs that depend on the block number, actually. I mean, they could have done worse. They could have just had a counter. So the security of FileVault is, as of now, as I see it, is holding up pretty well, except for um, attacks that exploit uh, the, uh, the implementation or that exploit data leakage outside of the actual container. And of course, um, passphrase cracking. Um, I also don't think that you can do much with the, with the theoretical, um, I wouldn't say it's a vulnerability, but the theoretical problems that you have with Yarrow. I mean, um, because the security server is feeding um, the, the, uh, the kernel entropy through def random, other processes can do that as well. They can, I mean, you can write like a huge chunk of, of zeros into your entropy pool. And th this does even work if you're not root. Um, but <laughs> it doesn't compromise the system. And, um, this shows that uh, Yarrow is kind of a robust design, and it also shows that Apple has made a good choice in choosing Yarrow, although they maybe should have modified it a little bit more, um, more elegantly, let's put it that way. So I hope this answers your question. OK. I have a question over here. OK. Over here, <laughs> to your left. Oh, okay, sorry. So there seems to be uh, recently a lot of backlash against researchers looking at Apple stuff, as we saw by the, the wireless driver stuff that happened. I was wondering if uh, any, any Mac uh, fans have contacted you or if you expect uh, to receive any emails or anything of the sort. Oh, okay. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> um, I actually received an email a couple of hours ago. Um, um, yeah. I hope he's not in the audience. <laughs> okay. So I should translate. Um, Basically, he's asking about the lecture that we're giving here, and he's stating that he's an Apple user himself, and asks what we want to show in um, this talk. He asks whether it's insecure. He asks whether, whoops, maximize, whether one should use this technique. Of course, I haven't replied to this mail yet, so of course, yes, Gunnar, you should use this technique. Mm -hmm. And he's complaining, I mean, he, he doesn't know what we're talking about, but he's complaining that we all, always show attacks here. I mean, <laughs> what the? <laughs> and he's asking whether we basically want to spread FUD. I mean, 
Sorry, you look like a typical Apple fanboy to me. I mean, I like Apple products, but I can also be critical of them. And I think um, this is not, I mean, this is not only, this can only be seen with Apple products, but with, with Apple products, there's um, a huge amount of users that get very, very protective of their operating system and of their, um, of their power books or MacBooks or whatever it is. For me, it's just like a piece of technology, and I chose this because um, it, it, is, it was good at the time for what I wanted to do, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah, well, I didn't write it, sorry. <laughs> okay. More questions? Okay, here in the back, in the middle. Um, I, I just comments on the uh, question one before. Um, there is a problem with the constant initialization vector per block, which is uh, theoretically uh, just um, uh, um, cryptographic, uh, well, malpractice. Um, wait a second. Um, it's not constant per block. Uh, once, once you choose your key, it's yes, constant. That so you, for your container, it's always the same whatever you write into the block. That's correct. And uh, the second point is um, the bit flipping attack in, is in general also possible with CBC mode. The CBC mode doesn't protect the integrity of the data. That's correct as well. Yeah. Okay, so this wasn't really a question, but thank you for adding to the content of this talk. More questions or comments? Um, I just wanted to say there is a little tool called class dump, yes. which uh, lets you dump a header file from an Objective C class. That's you can use that uh, tool on the on the disk image uh, framework itself, and there's coming some interesting stuff out of it. That's quite correct. But have you actually done that? Have you looked at the output? Yes. Okay. What do you see? Because. Um, the thing is, um, although there is a little bit of objective C for the glue code, most of the stuff is um, implemented in C++. And you just see, when you use class, then you just see um, the uh, methods that allow you to connect to the framework, and you, don't, you can't actually see inside. Yeah, that's true. Okay. But it's still interesting, though, I think. Well, maybe. Okay. More questions? Did we disappoint you? Did you, did you expect to firewall to be completely broken? <laughs> Can we have a vote on that? How many, how many of you came here expecting firewall to be totally broken? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, we gotta try harder then. So the source code will be live in about mm, five minutes, uh, crypto.nsa.org. <laughs>